You don't have to show up to everything to, to take pictures. If you want to make money from it, you have to look at it in a completely different mindset and a completely different perspective. Are you going to pay to look like an influencer or are you going to be paid as an influencer? Influencer, influencer. Welcome to the Yes to You podcast, where we empower women to manifest their vision of happiness and success with down to earth practical guidance for conscious living, personal growth, and entrepreneurship. Our goal is to see you take inspired action by saying yes to your calling. I'm your host and the founder of RohiniWellness.com, Dominique D. Wilson. And now, let's get into the topic of the hour. Welcome to episode 14 of the Yes to You podcast. I'm very excited about this episode because we are going to be talking about getting paid. That's right. If you've been creating loads of content, writing blogs, and not necessarily seeing that convert into dollars and cents, then you'll definitely want to listen to this entire episode because you are in for a real treat. Our guest today is going to be walking us through some insider tips that you need to know if you plan on getting paid as an influencer, in particular as a blogger. Just to give you a little sneak preview, first of all, we're going to talk about the main thing you need to know first if you want to get paid. Then we'll talk about some mindset shifts that can help you overcome adversity and stay focused in your business, know your worth, and really be able to communicate that with confidence. We're also going to talk about some ways in which you can leverage social media to build lasting connections with influencers in your industry. You'll learn a strategy to come up with endless ideas for content and so much more. With that said, to get the absolute most out of this episode, I highly recommend that if you're just getting started out as a blogger, you go back and listen to episode six of the podcast, which is entitled Blogging 101, Launch, Promote, and Stay Consistent. This is going to give you a very solid foundation to kind of get off the ground and get your feet wet. I also recommend that you listen to episode two of the podcast, which talks about creating a bold vision for your inspired life. This episode goes hand in hand with my free Create Your Vision workbook, which you can find at rohiniwellness.com forward slash vision. It's going to help you to create a vision so that everything that you do in your life and business is in alignment with what you ultimately want to experience in this life. So just to summarize, listen to episodes two and six and also download my free Create Your Vision workbook. Without further ado, let's go ahead and meet today's guest. I'm very excited about our guest today who happens to be a paid event blogger. She is an award-winning blogger, creator and producer of the podcast, A Toast to Truth. She's a speaker, community builder, and through her blog, she covers, promotes, and markets events from local to global businesses. In her free time, she's a Mavs Nation fan. She's (laughs) a Netflix connoisseur, a chocolate lover, a book snob, and a nap expert. (laughs) She's been featured on EO Fire Podcast, Madame Noir, CNBC.com, as well as various websites, podcasts, and blogs. And there's so much that I could say about our incredible guest today, so it is my absolute pleasure to welcome to the show, Vanetta R. Freeney. Thank you for having me and for everyone who's tuning in to this amazing podcast. Absolutely. So, Renetta, I just have to ask, I know that you're based in Houston, so why Mavericks? <laughs> because I grew up in a small town called White House, Texas, which is two hours from Dallas. So those were the games we saw on TV, and those were the games my mom would drive us to. <laughs> so I just became engrossed with the team. <laughs> Awesome, awesome. I always like to get people's story about how they got connected with their team of choice. So that's pretty cool. So I know that you're a paid event blogger. Can you mm-hmm. speak to that a little bit and tell tell me what exactly does that entail? Do you cover just live events or do you also cover things like holidays? Just tell us a little bit about that process. Okay, so when I first became a professional blogger in 2011, the very first time I got paid for anything related to my blog was to cover a natural hair event. So a website in DC paid me for that. So that kind of got me on the journey. It wasn't until 2018 when Jay Stone, she's a master brand coach, yeah. asked me, you know, like what did I want to do? Cause I was transitioning through some things and I wasn't sure. And I said, okay, She said, well, what do you get paid the most from? 
And I thought about it. And I said, events. So she was like, okay, so you're a paid event blogger. So that's how <laughs> that, <laughs> so that's how that came about. But essentially I cover promote and market events. So as far as covering them, I can show up, post on social media or manage your social media the day of and write a recap. So it's, you know, keeping the, the buzz of your event going the day of when I cover an event. If I'm promoting, that means I'm usually going to be there in person at your event. So I'm kind of letting people know, like, hey, I'm going to be there. Come join me. See me there. Whatever to get people there. Marketing, that's a whole different beast. <laughs> You know, managing, making sure that we reach the goal, fill the quota, get butts and seats. I prefer live events to virtual events. And so it's not holiday themed or anything like that. It's just a live event. So a conference, a half day event, a two two hour event. I prefer not to do brunches. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's probably one of the few events I I prefer not to cover just because brunch to me means eating and not like socializing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> In that sense, I'm like, I'm there for my mimosas and French toast. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a lot of fun. So is this something that you did um, as a hobby starting out? Just or well, when I, blogging um, about something else? Sorry. No, when when I when I started blogging in September 2011, my focus was to get paid um, as a blogger. I just wasn't sure how to get paid as a blogger. What's that? Seven over seven and a half years ago, there there weren't a lot of information uh, available to to do that. So when the opportunity presented itself that they wanted to pay me, I said, okay, so that's one avenue. Um, but I, but my focus and my priority, it was taboo. It really was taboo back then to say you wanted to get paid as a blogger because a lot of people were doing this as a hobby. But I, I saw the event and I was like, yeah, I could cover it. I didn't know what that meant, but I was like, yeah, I can do, <laughs> yeah, I could do it. So it really, it wasn't a hobby. The focus was to get paid. I just wasn't sure how to do, how to get paid. And then the opportunity presented itself and I was like okay let's let's do this <laughs> well that's that's awesome and it speaks to having that mindset of knowing what it is that you want to get out of it and then look where it led so that's pretty cool so how did you get um, into were you always interested in writing in particular or was it something that you came into later in your life um, I've always been a writer because um, I'm an introvert so that to me is the best way I can express how I'm feeling about a situation because people say when I speak to them, my tone may be a little curt at <laughs> times or my directness, you know, offends people. But when I write, I have the time to process my thoughts and, and get it on paper. And so when I started blogging 2009, I just used it as an online diary, online journal, because I like to journal. I didn't think anybody was going to read it. People were reading that particular blog. I still remember the name. It was Praying for Purpose because I hated my job at the time. <laughs> so I mainly blogged about my job. But I, I'm a writer and I taught English as a second language for 11 years. And, and my specialty was teaching non-native English speakers how to write. So, yeah, that is, it was by trade, by passion, by interest. And so blogging was just a natural progression of my love of writing. That's awesome. And I think um, what you said, a lot of people can relate to. I myself am also an introvert. <laughs> and I've been told, oh, you're too blunt with people. Sometimes I, I got told that a lot actually growing up because, you know, kids just say whatever's on their mind. Yeah. Um, but learning how to use writing as a way to process your thoughts. I also find that writing is a lot, comes a lot easier for me than, mm -hmm. than speaking. So very, very interesting. So can you tell us a little bit about your journey as an entrepreneur in particular in terms of did you come from an entrepreneurial background? Was it something you always knew you wanted to do in terms of working for yourself or was there a transition at some point? Um, I have a few family members who call themselves an entrepreneur, but they never really make money to pay their bills, if that makes sense. So I always saw it as like a struggle, like everybody in the family had to jump in and help out and be unpaid employees, you know? <laughs> yeah. So I never, so it, it didn't really cross my mind, but I knew 
that because of where I grew up, a lot of the white people who own businesses, they had substantial finance finances. Like they had nice houses, nice cars. They could take care of their kids. Their kids had nice cars and stuff like that. And so I knew a business would be a good choice. I just didn't know what to do, how to do. I thought I would teach for X amount of years, save up money, and then I would open a business. So deep down, I knew I would have one. I just didn't know what it was going to be, how to start. Um, So me kind of stumbling into it in um, 2011 because of budget cuts. I left the school district at that time. I kind of just was forced into it. You know, it was a hiring freeze all over Texas. So they were barely hiring teachers who got cut or teachers who were graduating. So I kind of jumped into it because I had no choice. I had a mortgage. I had a responsibility and I had to figure it out. So the first few years I I continued to teach in adult schools and do private tutoring for ESL and, and things like that. And I officially retired in April 2018. But I thought I would have more time to prepare (laughs) Mm -hmm. to be an entrepreneur so that my finances were more secure, but I didn't have, life didn't turn out that way. I just kind of jumped in. Right. That's, that's a big change to go from having that security to thinking, oh, wow, like, what am I going to do now? So what was that like for you to have to go through that process? Like externally, I know when we, when I've been through things, you're like, okay, what do I have to do next? You go into action mode, but what was the, the internal process of having to deal with such a major change for you? Looking back now, it was traumatic because I didn't know I was suffering from depression at the time. The way that I left teaching was very, very, very traumatic because I was forced to resign. And I lo- I loved my students. I may not have liked the school I was teaching at, but I loved my students. Mm -hmm. And I actually resigned in March and the school district would not let me leave until the end of my contract, which was June 30th, the day before my birthday. So I technically was unemployed on my 27th birthday, (laughs) but I had to stay from March to June because of contractual agreement. Mm -hmm. So staying at a job that you know you're technically not employed there, but you have to stay there. It was very depressing. It, it it was draining. It was aggravating. I did use up all my sick days and all, all the leave days that I had. I was going to things. I went to a Mavericks playoff game. I would just take the day off and go hang out at the movies or whatever. Like mm-hmm. it was, I'm a type A person. And so routine and order, those are things that I find comfort. And so it was a very chaotic few months for me. Um, And then not being able to find another job just added more stress because I'm like, I just bought this condo a year before and here I am with no job, a mortgage. The bank was not helpful (laughs) because I was like, you know, can you help me out here? (laughs) Yeah. And so just trying to. So the pressure of all of that when you're starting a business um, and you didn't have your finances secure, I, I cash out my 401k to try to get you know, us through a few months. So it was, it was chaotic because I didn't know what I was doing. I had no one to kind of lead me on what was smart. Like it wasn't smart for me to do that to my retirement, you know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but it it definitely was probably a chaotic time to try to understand emotionally what happened with the job financially, how to take care of myself and my family and just understanding entrepreneurship at the time because there wasn't a lot online and I didn't know where to go offline at that time either. So it traumatic and chaotic would probably be the two best words to describe that period of my life. Yeah, I can I can only imagine that's a lot to to juggle and to just keep your head on straight. And I love how you interjected that you took those times, those days for self-care and use that available sick time or whatever you had to just pour back into yourself because yeah. that, it is draining to go through something like that. So, and they said they weren't going to pay me for them. So they, and I called the district HR people and they were like, well, we're not going to pay you because I never took off. Wow. Like all the years I had worked there, I never took off unless it was an emergency. Like when my aunt passed away, I took off. I was sick one time. I took off. 
So I had all these days and they were like, well, we're not going to we're not going to pay you because normally when you leave, they'll give you the money for those days Yeah. Um, on your last check. They said no. So I said, OK, well, I'm going to take every single day. I've <laughs> never taken. <laughs> I, I went to that. Arizona for a week, you know, so I, at the time I didn't know it was self-care, but I, I'm like, if I have these days. They're not going to pay me back for them. I might as well just use them. And let's just say, even though it was chaotic and traumatic, it was very peaceful in Miss Franey's class the last couple of months because every time I came back, I was refreshed. I was renewed. My students benefited from it. We had a great last couple of months of school. So, yeah, I was I didn't know about self-care, but I sure did take those days. <laughs> Absolutely. So now looking back at your journey, if you had to go back and speak to yourself, let's say a few years prior to now, what would you tell younger Vernetta? Ooh, it would depend on what younger Vernetta is going through <laughs> at the time. But essentially the advice I would give myself, say five years ago, is everything in life is temporary. Like it doesn't matter how horrible it may seem at the moment. It's temporary. You know, buckle down, stay focused on looking for the light and continue to move towards the light, even if you don't see it. Wow, that's powerful. Everything is temporary. Wow. Yeah, because in the moment, it's so easy to forget that. And it can feel like like forever. It's a lifetime. Yes. (laughs) Yes, yes. Wow, that's powerful. So fast forwarding a little bit, can you tell us about what has been the most challenging aspect of your journey as an entrepreneur? The most challenging would be the fact that I am a blogger and I own that title. And so sometimes other entrepreneurs and small business owners don't give the respect of that title as they would if they, you know, the term entrepreneur. Hmm. So is the biggest challenge has been to deal with people who see what I do as fun and as a hobby and not a real business. But yet they need my services because they're not exactly sure how to use social media to market and promote their events, their Mm -hmm. their business. You know, (laughs) so it's the irony of not feeling respected by, quote unquote, real entrepreneurs. And yet they need exactly what I do. That's very interesting. I never actually thought about that, but I can I think I can see where you're coming from. And so what has been the highlight of your journey? in terms of blogging and the business you've built for yourself? Um, I would say the people I've met. I, I've met some incredible people from all over the world. I mean, just a, a couple of months ago, a film director from Nigeria was in Houston, and we follow each other on Twitter, and I by chance emailed her, not knowing she was in town, and we met up. So she's one of, you know, Nigeria's top film director so just wow. having the chance to meet someone that you follow on Twitter and she's in town and we meet up for breakfast you know that it was a great conversation we had a great time but just the connections with people I would not otherwise have a chance to meet that's very interesting so when you say you're an introvert mm-hmm. was there ever a time where that was difficult because I know when you go into business for yourself you are meeting more people and making more connections has that been a process for you or has it always been pretty simple to make those to build those relationships building relationships forever in my entire life has been a very complicated situation because I may like you but I know I need space and people growing up didn't understand that so in business I had to figure out the best way for me to build relationships where the other person didn't feel like I'm ghosting them but I'm also giving myself time to not feel drained by having to constantly be connected and and for me to be an extreme introvert I have built very very deep relationships with a lot of people because I understand how I operate and I let people know that I'm an introvert they may not understand what it means but through us building a relationship they'll see that I'm loyal that you know, I'm trustworthy. I'll communicate with you. I'll help you. I'll support you. But I'm not going to like constantly feel some type of we have to communicate 24 <laughs> seven, mm-hmm. you know, so 
for any introvert who's listening, understand what works best for you and just kind of relay that to other people. Um, they may not get it, but over time, they'll see and they'll respect and they'll understand it. Right before recording this, I put, you know, I peopled yesterday because I covered an event <laughs> and I said introvert down. So, you know, a lot of people in my online community have learned about introverts because I share, you know, what we need, how we communicate, how we do things. So a lot of people who work with me have some type of connection to my online community. So they're aware in advance that I'm not going to be someone who wants to hop on the phone. We need to schedule a time and a date. <laughs> and I need at least 12 hours notice before we hop on the phone. Um, so it's educating. If you're an introvert, it's educating your audience, your community, how you communicate so that you can fully communicate to them and they feel that they're getting what they need from you. Absolutely. I I feel like you're reading my mind with everything <laughs> you just said because – like having that notice so that you can prepare for the conversation mm -hmm. and people are like, well, why can't we just do it now? And it's like, so, Ooh, yes, <laughs> <laughs> I love that you're so forward and that you just let people know right off the bat. And if they get it, they'll get it eventually, you know? Yeah. So that's awesome. Well, I know you mentioned that you met Jay Stone, which I think is amazing. Who have, <laughs> who, well, first I'd like to know, how did you get connected with Jay Stone? We met on Twitter. Okay. So most of my Best connections I've met on Twitter. I've, we, I've made on Twitter. So she and I met on Twitter. Um, she told this story. Um, it was when she was on T.D. Jakes, um, his show that he had on BET some years ago. And mm -hmm. she was a guest. And, um, you know, I watched the show and I reached out and I was like, oh, my God, you know, I have some of the same issues. And then people started fat shaming her. And that really ticked me off because I was like, well, I don't understand why you're being so mean to her. Like she, mm -hmm. she poured her soul out. And so um, I started defending her online. I didn't know her, you know, other than what I had seen on, on the show. And we just kind of developed a relationship online. And then we, when we met in person the first time, it was like we clicked. But yeah, I reached out to her on Twitter because I saw her on the TD Jake show and just wanted to let her know like, hey, you know, you're not the only one who struggles with weight. I, you know, I'm, people think I'm anorexic because I can't gain weight. So I understood where she was coming from about um, how people perceive you as far as your, as your weight. And, you know, that was like, had to be like 2012 to, yeah, about 2012. So, you know, seven years, we've just stayed connected and she's a great person and we've just gotten to know each other. That's awesome. It's so it's so important to have those real conversations online because you just never know what can develop out of that. And I just love how you were being yourself and just sharing your thoughts and then made this amazing uh, connection. Mm -hmm. So who else have been some of your mentors, whether you met them in person or just distant mentors along the way? Um, I would definitely say Lamar Tyler. I ran across black and married with kids .com. He and his wife started that, that blog. And now they have like, um, it's grown to a website and they have all these businesses. And over the years I've, I've watched how he's become more than a blogger. You know, he's, he's running an enterprise now. He has sold out conferences and cruises and, and all of these things. And we, he and I have met a few times. I've gone to his CSP live a couple of years ago. And so is, funny because you know we we just kind of communicate in this group and, and things like that and anytime I notice that there's someone looking for a blogger in Houston he he recommends me so it's those things where I'm like oh wow you know like Jason and, and Lamar Tyler in my mind in the blog world they're big to me like they're they're pretty big names and so to have relationships where they feel okay, where they will refer or recommend me for something, or they'll send information like, hey, you need to check this out, or, you know, hey, maybe you should do this. To me, that's very special, because it's not every day that someone on their level will just say, hey, you know, like, I see that you're trying to do something, let me pour into you. And so Lamar Tyler would definitely be a person that I say I admire and I respect um, just because knowing he came from the blog world <laughs> yeah. and now he's so big. Um, Jason came, you know, she was, a, she was a, a brand, she had a brand business, but how we met, she was a blogger. 
at the time um because she had like black love forum and she was writing for essence and and that's how she got on the td jakes show so she was a blogger at the time so i met those two as they were considered bloggers in about 2012 2013 some other people i would say that i admire would be like christine st v of moms in charge um she has an amazing blog and we met online and then we met at some different conferences and, you know, we, we built a relationship. Um, Pamela Booker, she has coils by nature, which is a natural hair care product line that I, I use her products. Now she's in Target and all these other places. So to see these people that I've met at like different blog conferences and they're so big and they, they haven't forgotten, you know, as little people, <laughs> as I would like to say, as little people, but they're, they're all approachable. They're all nice and, and, and genuinely will share when they have the chance or they see the opportunity. It seems like you're really good at connecting with people online and also, as you said, at conferences and facilitating those relationships. And so it's great to be able to have them recommend you and watch them grow through their journey and be inspired by some of the things that they're doing as well. Oh, yeah. So um, I know being a content creator can get kind of crazy sometimes because there's so many ideas going. So how? what are some of the ways that you continue to come up with fresh content? I know that you also have a podcast. Mm-hmm. And um, so how do you come up with – what is a little bit of your creative process for coming up with new ideas for what it is that you want to talk about next? I look at everything as an opportunity. I, um, I'm a huge Netflix watcher. Like, you know, Mm -hmm. I I call myself a Netflix connoisseur because I'll watch movies that people would not even know would be on Netflix. Like I love foreign TV and foreign films. Mm -hmm. And so, um, it may be a line from one of the movies or one of the shows that I've watched and I'll write a whole blog post on that. For example, I did a whole Facebook live on using Netflix as a way to find content ideas and so (laughs) i was watching this bollywood movie about this 13 year old princess this was before england colonized india and it was something that she said to her husband you know he's like this almost four year old man and she's 13 and it was something she said and I wrote a whole blog post on it because it was it was a powerful feeling that she had because she was conflicted. She knew she had to live up to a queen standard, but at the same time, she wanted to protect like regular everyday people because technically she wasn't in line to be a queen. She wasn't royal blood. She was her father was the head advisor or whatever of a royal family, but he took a liking to her. And so that's what happened. So I wrote a blog post. uh, No, I did a podcast on her strength of trying to balance what she didn't see as destiny and what destiny saw for her. Other times it may be just some random idea or book that I read. So for me, content can be found everywhere. Mm -hmm. You just have to pay attention to what strikes you and what really lights a fire in you. If that fire is still there the next day, then maybe you should write about it or podcast or do a live stream on it. Absolutely. So what are some of the things that you do to stay consistent, to stay focused? One of the biggest problems I hear from a lot of bloggers is that it either gets overwhelming at some point or they're trying to be on, you know, eight different social media sites. So maybe if you could share a little bit about how you stay organized so that you can manage and grow what it is that you're working on. Well, I'm type A personality. So um, (laughs) I always like to give that caveat because I've been an organized person my whole life. Like I organize everybody's life. And then when I was in the classroom, everything was organized. Everything was labeled. Everything had its place. And my students knew that. Like I taught kindergarten and first grade in the public school. Mm -hmm. And people are like, how are you getting six-year-olds to know where to put stuff, how to keep (laughs) it clean? Like you can walk into my classroom at any time. There was no paper on the floor. There was nothing out of order. And I said the first two weeks, I explained to them, everything has a place, everything has order, and that's how we're going to function in this classroom. And so I translate that in all aspects of my life. Everything's organized. Everything is written down. I have a to-do list. Everything is prioritized. Um, I do not try to do everything in one day. 
I have one or two things that I'm going to accomplish for the day. And then that gives me time to post on social media, to answer emails, um, to return quick phone calls or something like that. I was at a uh, the U.S. Chamber small business event and the lady in the productivity masterclass said that Americans lose 2.5 days a year looking for misplaced stuff Wow! because a lot of people are not, you know, as organized. So, she, you know, she gave some tips, but for bloggers, a lot of times they're overwhelmed because they don't know how to say no. Mm. It has nothing to do with not being organized because everybody has their own system, their own organization system. A lot of burnout and overwhelmment and the blog world comes because you feel you have to say yes to everything, that you're going to miss some opportunity if you say no, or if you don't attend some event, or if you don't partner, collaborate with someone, it's okay to say no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is one of the first things to help you stay organized, because if you're saying no, then that means you will start saying yes to things that align with your niche, what you like to do, what you have time to do what your skill set allows at that moment. There are some things that I turned down because I just did not have the capacity or the skill set to do it years ago. Now I can do it because I've developed those skills over time, but mm -hmm. I didn't feel like I was missing anything um, saying no, but I've never had a problem saying no. I know a lot of women struggle with that, but I don't, I don't have that problem. <laughs> well, that is awesome to not have that problem because, yeah, like you said, a lot of people do struggle with that kind of people pleasing, you know, mm -hmm. and not knowing where to draw that that boundary at. So um, other than knowing when to what to say yes to and what to say no to, what advice would you give someone who is just starting off as a blogger and they haven't maybe found their voice quite yet and they're just trying to look forward to maybe building a business or blogging for their business? Do you have any advice for someone like that? I'll give three pieces of advice. The first one, do not spend a lot of money. I've seen bloggers want to come out and hire a designer and spend $3,000 on the blog layout, colors, fonts, all of this stuff. When you don't know what your voice is, the color scheme is not going to make a difference. You know, <laughs> mm -hmm. There's no reason for you to go broke before you even begin. So definitely don't spend unnecessary money. Yeah, you want it to look nice. Aesthetics are important, but you don't need to go all out. Two, you have to understand the time commitment of being a blogger. A lot of people think, oh, I can do it in an hour a week. Okay, that may be you writing one blog post. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of bloggers are not writers. A lot of bloggers feel intimidated by writing, but they have thoughts that they want to say, but the process may take them longer. I can write a blog post in 15 minutes, but I'm a writer, so words come easier to me. Speaking, I can create a video in one take. It's not going to be edited, and I know I'm not going to edit the video, so I'm going to say what I'm going to say. Other people feel that they need to edit and make it look a certain way. You have to understand the time commitment of being a blogger or an influencer. Um, the third piece of advice I would give someone is give yourself time to grow and to develop and evolve. I may have started off being paid as an event blogger in 2011, but I did not focus on it until 2019. During that other time, I was doing other things that I thought were important. So I was evolving, I was growing, I was learning, I was seeing what I like to do, what I didn't like to do, what I was good at at the time, the skills that I had at the time. So give yourself time to grow and develop. You don't have to be perfect coming out at the gate. No one should expect you to be perfect and you should allow yourself to have fun. It shouldn't be like some high stress <laughs> type of situation. It should be something yeah. you want to do and not someone pressure you. Oh, you're you're good at taking pictures. You need to be an influencer. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to be an influencer, you don't have to be and you shouldn't feel pressure to be. I love those tips. I think those are right spot on. And I especially love how you emphasize give yourself time because Nowadays, we're bombarded with people telling us what we should be doing in our business. Mm -hmm. You know, you should have this much success and you should be doing this this many times a week. And you can turn something you love into a chore if you don't give yourself time to unfold and you're trying to make it into something that maybe is not meant to be. So I, I love and that you said that. 
and like I, I posted um, from Fortune um, dot com, Fortune magazine, they did a study, and in 2017, only 117,000 influencers made more than ten thousand dollars for the year. Yeah, so a lot of people were like, that stat is crazy. Now, mind you, it was like 17 million influencers were counted for 2017, but only 117,000 made more than $10,000. So this industry of people thinking they can become an influencer and immediately make all this money, the reality is it's not there yet. Mm -hmm. The money may be there, but as far as a lot of people making money from it, It has not connected just yet. And a lot of times, the reason a lot of people don't make money is because they do a lot of things for free. Because a brand's like, oh, well, we don't have the budget. You make billions of dollars a year. You don't have a budget to pay me $50, you know? (laughs) So when a lot of influencers accept a lot of free opportunities, there's there's no pressure from the for brands to pay people. Mm -hmm. Now, they'll pay people when you ask. Like, I'll tell people, even when I got started, and people are like, what do you do here? I'm like, you know what? It's $50 because I got to get there. Gas money. You know, like something. Mm -hmm. And I hardly had people tell me no. To this day, I still have hardly have people tell me no when I'm saying, here's my fee. A lot of other people will gladly say, yes, I'll do it. And, you know, and then at the end of the year, they're part of the millions of people who don't make ten thousand mm. dollars as a blogger because you kept saying yes. So it goes back to learn to say no. You're not missing a whole lot, but you are losing a whole lot when you're saying yes to a lot of things and you're not counting the cost because you're not counting your travel there. You're not counting if you're buying new outfits, new makeup, getting your hair done um, in Houston. You know, certain places you have to pay for parking. Um, sometimes they want you to come to an event and then they want you to buy the ticket. All of these expenses for you to say that you worked with so-and-so. I'm like, no, I like, I, I have bills, you know, my car, my, um, phone. I like to eat, you know, <laughs> I shop at Target, <laughs> but it's not cheap at Target. So it's, it's those things that I keep in the back of my mind as to why I don't run all over Houston. And, and run all over town and say, yeah, I'm going to be here. I'm going to be here. I don't have to pose for the ground. And a lot of bloggers need to understand that you don't have to show up to everything to, to take pictures. If you want to make money from it, you have to look at it in a completely different mindset and a completely different perspective. Are you going to pay to look like an influencer or are you going to be paid as an influencer? Wow, that is powerful. Thank you so much for for sharing that. And that goes back to just being able to know your worth so that you mm-hmm. you do have that um, courage to be able to say, well, this is my fee without stuttering. <laughs> and yeah, you have bills. Say, Remember that. Bills, bills. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So do you have a favorite book that's been helpful to you on your journey that you'd like to recommend to listeners? Yes. Blue Ocean Strategy. So I read this book. In undergrad, my senior year of undergrad, I was taking some business classes. Most business books put me to sleep, but that Mm -hmm. one, it was just so different. And I read it every few years. So I've read it several times and I never read books more than once unless I really like it. And I've read that one like four or five times. And essentially what Blue Ocean Strategy is, is people who are creating something new in an industry. You don't have a blueprint. You're literally the blueprint maker. So the person who created Weblog in 19, um, what was that like 1998, 1999, they Mm -hmm. were a blue ocean. No one was writing stuff online, posting stuff online before that person Mm -hmm. created it or, you know, started doing that. Amazon is a blue ocean. No one was selling books online in the mid 90s. Now, you know, everybody's selling stuff online. So Blue Ocean Strategy, I always tell people read that book because it'll change how you do things. Even if you're in a saturated market, how can you create your own Blue Ocean to stand out? One way I do it as an event blogger here in the city is I charge. A lot of people don't. Mm. (laughs) 
So a lot of people know if they're going to approach me, they need to have a budget mm -hmm. because we're going to be talking about what your budget is and, and what your budget allows me to do. So that book, Blue Ocean Strategy. Awesome. That sounds amazing. I love when you have a book that you can kind of go back to and get a different perspective from it each time you read it. So yes. I will definitely add that one to my reading list as well. So I know we're nearing uh, just around the end of our time. Can you tell our listeners where they can connect with you and learn more about you? Yeah. So, of course, Twitter. So it's B-R-F-R-E-E-N-E-Y. -E -E Twitter is my playground. Um, and then you can always go to VernettaRFranny.com. There's my blog post, my um, YouTube channel, my podcast. Everything is there. But if you definitely want to just have fun, kiki, you know, randomness, Twitter is, is where <laughs> is where I like to hang out. But I'm Vernetta Arfrini everywhere online. Awesome. Awesome. Well, before we go, I just want to acknowledge you for a couple things. Number one, I want to acknowledge you for your courage. Um, for going through what you've been through, having to transition from your job, dealing with depression, but to keep your eyes focused on what you want and to have the courage to just continue. I really admire that. And also the Thank courage you. to talk about it openly. Absolutely. And the second thing I want to acknowledge you for is your transparency. You know, you're so open about your story. You don't hold back on anything. And I think <laughs> that is very rare and undervalued in our society. And so I appreciate you for those, those things. Thank you. Um, to, to kind of piggyback on what you just said, um, my sister, she was like, you're so open online. And I told her, I was like, you know, God had a conversation with me. And he said, you have to share your story because it's going to help other people. Yes. And so, you know, everyone's not strong enough or they may feel shamed by their story. And so I know me being open is a breakthrough for other people. And I have no shame with the things that I've been through. You know, um, I've dealt with homelessness. I did a whole podcast episode on that, you know, as an entrepreneur. So there are a lot of things I've done and I've gone through, but I don't have any shame because it's my story. Like, how can mm -hmm. someone shame me for my story? You know, it didn't affect you. Like, I didn't. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> you know, it, it had no, no, no bearing on your life. But yeah, so God told me that I needed to, to be open and, and to share because other people are going to learn. And they're going to find resources through me sharing my story. Wow. Well, thanks again for sharing and for coming on this show. It's been such a pleasure talking to you and getting to know you a little bit better. And I hope to connect with you again in the future. Oh, most definitely. And thank you for your audience for listening. And, you know, I really hope that me sharing something will, will benefit them. I so enjoyed today's conversation with Vernetta. I learned so much from hearing her story and her just sharing her experience. And I hope that you got something valuable out of this episode too. With that said, come on over to social media and post your takeaways from today's episode and also any questions that you may have around the topic of blogging and in particular, getting paid as an influencer. And be sure to use hashtag yes to you pod so that I can find your questions, takeaways, and comments. And don't forget to check the show notes at yes to you podcast.com for episode 14 because you'll find all of the links to the resources mentioned in this episode, including the book that Vernetta recommended and how to get in contact with Vernetta. In addition, Vernetta has a free gift to all the listeners, which is a playlist that she's put together of tips and strategies to get paid as a blogger. So you definitely don't want to miss out on this amazing free resource. So go over to yestoupodcast.com, episode 14, and check out the show notes. Also, if you have a question or suggestion for a future episode, email me at feedback at yestoupodcast.com. And finally, don't forget to tune in this Thursday for your weekly wellness tip. In the meantime, remember, you get to choose how you show up in life. Love yourself fiercely, own your story, and say yes to your calling. It was a pleasure to have you join us for this episode of the Yes to You podcast. 
If you haven't already, be sure to visit rohiniwellness.com forward slash vision to download Dominique's free PDF starter guide, the Create Your Vision Workbook. If this episode was helpful for you, please leave us a review on your favorite podcast player. Also, when you share this episode on social media using hashtag yes to you pod, we'll give you a shout out on a future episode. We look forward to inspiring you next time right here on the yes to you podcast.